When you hear that a plane has crashed, your mind probably jumps to something going wrong in the air. But the truth is, one of the most dangerous parts of any flight is when it's on the ground. On October 8th, 2001, the worst air crash in Italian history took place at Milan Zanata Airport in northern Italy. This crash was all the more tragic because of how preventable it was. The warning signs had been blaring for years, but they were repeatedly ignored by the Italian authorities. In fact, the one piece of technology which could have prevented the entire incident was sitting in a box at the airport at the time, waiting to be installed. This is not a story of unfortunate coincidences or unforeseeable failures. Rather, this is a story of an entirely predictable and preventable accident. This is the story of the Lanate Airport disaster. On the morning of October 8th, 2001, two aircraft were preparing to depart Milan's Lanate Airport. One was a Scandinavian Airlines McDonnell Douglas MD87, bound for Copenhagen in Denmark, while the other was a Cessna Citation CJ2, bound for Paris in France. On board the Scandinavian plane were 104 passengers and six crew. Most of the passengers were Italian, although there were a number of other nationalities on board, including some Danish, Swedish, Norwegian, Finnish, and others. The pilots were both 36 years old, and between them they had more than 10,000 hours of flying experience. The captain, Joachim Gustafsson, was Swedish, and had been hired by Scandinavian 11 years previously, in 1990. He was relatively new to the MD-87, however, having just logged 230 hours on it. In his most recent simulator check in May that year, he'd received the comment, very high standard. The first officer, Anders Highlander, had been hired by SAS four years ago, and he had more experience on the MD-87, having logged about 2,000 hours on it. His most recent simulator check was the previous month, and he received the comment, above average. The Scandinavian jet was parked at a gate on the east side of the airport. Across the runway, at the general aviation apron, was the Cessna Citation jet. It was brand new, having just been registered the previous month. The pilots had just landed at Lanate a few minutes earlier, and were due to take two passengers from Milan to Paris. This was a demonstration flight, where one of the passengers, an Italian businessman, would be shown what the aircraft was like by the other passenger, a salesman for the manufacturer. The captain of this flight, 36-year-old Horst Koenigsmann, had approximately 5,000 total flight hours logged. The first officer, 64-year-old Martin Schneider, had approximately 12,000 flight hours experience. Both pilots had been to Lanate before, with the captain having been there five times and the first officer having been there seven times in the previous two years. As such, they would have been relatively familiar with the layout of the airport. On this morning, Lanate was shrouded in thick fog. This weather was typical for the airport around this time of year, and controllers had become used to dealing with it. The airport had become busier in recent years, however, and it was decided that it would benefit from having a modern ground radar installed, which would show the position of aircraft as they manoeuvred around the taxiways and the runway. A ground radar system had been purchased in 1994, seven years previously, but all this time it had been sitting at the airport, waiting to be set up. An outdated system had been used at the airport before, but it was decommissioned two years previously, in 1999. With nothing but whiteness greeting them out the window, and no ground radar to guide them, the controllers had to rely on position reports from pilots to build a mental picture of what was happening on the ground. This day would have been a particularly good day to have ground radar. Both the tower and the ground controller were busy, as there were over two dozen aircraft manoeuvring in and around the airport at the time. At 5 minutes to 8 that morning, the ground controller gave the Scandinavian pilots clearance to taxi to runway 36 and asked them to report when they had entered the main taxiway. Three minutes later, the Cessna pilots, at the other side of the airport, requested clearance to start their engines. They received this clearance, and around the same time, the Scandinavian plane switched over to tower frequency. From this point on, each aircraft will be tuned to different radio frequencies, and talking to different controllers. At 5 past 8, as the Scandinavian jet was in the queue for takeoff, the Citation jet received its taxi clearance. Delta Victor X-Ray, taxi north via Romeo 5, call me back at the stop bar of the main runway extension. The pilot read back this instruction, saying, Roger, via Romeo 5, and and call you back before reaching the main runway. This is the route that the controller intended the citation to take. They were to taxi north onto taxiway Romeo 5 and call the controller when they had reached a stop marking on the taxiway. The pilots of the Cessna began their taxi and about three minutes later they made a position report telling the controller Delta India Echo Victor X-Ray is approaching Sierra 4. This confused the controller and he asked the pilots to clarify saying Confirm your position? The pilot answered Approaching the runway Sierra 4. Still confused, but deciding not to ask for clarification, the controller said, Roger, maintain the stop bar, I'll call you back. The citation replied, Roger, hold position. 
The controller then contacted another aircraft, which he thought was a few hundred meters ahead of the Citation, to ask its position and ensure that there was enough room to move the Citation forwards. Once he was sure that this aircraft was safely on the apron and no longer on Romeo 5, he then cleared the Citation to proceed along the taxiway, saying, Delta Victor X-Ray, continue your taxi on the main apron, follow the Alpha line. The Citation pilot replied, Roger, continue the taxi in main apron, Alpha line, the Delta Victor X-Ray. The controller then added, That is correct, and please call me back entering the main taxiway. I'll call you on the main taxiway, replied the Citation pilot. Unbeknownst to the controller, the Citation was actually not on Romeo 5, to the north of the airport, but way further south on Romeo 6. When the Citation pilot said he was passing Sierra 4, this is where he was. The pilots of the Citation could not have known that the controller had no idea what Sierra 4 was because it wasn't on his charts of the airport. The Cessna continued taxiing along Romeo 6 and, expecting to encounter the main taxiway soon enough, crossed a stop marking painted on the taxiway. As all of this was happening, just under 2 kilometres away, the Scandinavian MD-87 was lining up at the runway. At 9 minutes past 8 in the morning, the tower controller cleared the Scandinavian aircraft for takeoff. Scandinavia 686, Lenate, clear for takeoff 36, the wind is calm, report rolling, when airborne squawk ident. The Scandinavian plane replied, clear for takeoff 36, at when airborne squawk ident, and we are rolling, Scandinavian 686. Right after this clearance was given, another aircraft inquired about the runway visual range, which is the visibility along the runway surface. The controller replied that it was about 200 metres. The Scandinavian jet, which was starting to roll down the runway, was just about 1,500 metres from the point where the taxiway Sierra 4 intersected the runway. At this very moment, the Citation was continuing its taxi along Sierra 4. The pilots had not been given explicit permission to cross the runway. This normally can only be given by the tower controller, not the ground controller, and the Citation pilots were never told to contact tower control. Neither were they told to enter the runway, and yet, at 10 minutes past 6 that morning, that's exactly what they did. The active runway of an airport occupies a place of almost sacred significance, to enter it, explicit permission must be received from air traffic control. Entering an active runway without permission is one of the most serious incidents that can happen at an airport, and it's called a runway incursion. At this point, disaster was all but inevitable. In the fog, at the speed the Scandinavian jet was travelling, it could only see the runway about one second ahead of it. It reached takeoff speed of about 146 knots, or 270 km an hour, and the pilot began pulling the aircraft up into the air. But just as he did this, he caught sight of the Citation on the runway, and shouted, yanking back the control column in a desperate attempt to avoid the aircraft. It was too late, however. The bottom of the aircraft's fuselage smashed through the Citation, ripping it into three pieces and setting it ablaze. The right-hand landing gear leg was torn off of the Scandinavian jet, as well as the right-hand engine, but incredibly, the pilot continued flying the aircraft. He pushed the engine thrust to full power and managed to keep the aircraft airborne for 12 seconds, climbing gradually to a height of 10 metres. Unfortunately, the left engine had ingested debris and was unable to produce enough thrust for a climb. The aircraft fell back onto the runway and began sliding along the ground. The pilots continued trying to control the aircraft, applying maximum reverse thrust in the remaining engine and full braking on the wheels. They tried to steer the plane to keep it on the runway. However, the aircraft was so damaged and still travelling so fast that there was no way to stop it. Travelling at over 139 knots, or 257 kilometres an hour, the plane slid over the end of the runway and crashed into the airport baggage handling building 460 metres to the north. All 110 on board were instantly killed by the impact forces. The 10 tonnes of fuel which the aircraft had been carrying ignited, setting the building on fire. A few seconds later, the airport's traffic office contacted the tower by telephone and informed them that they heard a number of bangs. The tower controller said that they had heard them in the tower as well, but that it sounded like somebody climbing the steps to the tower. The person calling from the traffic office said that it sounded like an engine misfiring and asked the controller if there was anything abnormal happening on their end. The controller said that no, everything appeared okay. Despite how concerning this exchange should have been, the controller appeared unperturbed. In fact, the first alarm wasn't raised until a police officer and customs officer at one of the northern gates of the terminal heard an explosion and saw a man running towards them covered in flames. The fire brigade was called and they rushed to the baggage facility which was now engulfed in flames. They quickly realised that there were no survivors in the Scandinavian plane. It wasn't for at least another 10 minutes that the controller realised the Citation plane was missing and dispatched the fire brigade to the runway. When they arrived on scene, it was clear that nobody had survived the impact of the larger jet and the subsequent fire. Initial media reports after the accident speculated that terrorism may have been involved, as this crash occurred less than one month after the September 11th attacks in the US. However, these rumours were quickly dispelled by the Italian government and were ruled out almost immediately by the official investigation that followed. 
What was immediately clear from the outset of the investigation was that the cause of the accident was the incursion of the citation plane onto the runway while the Scandinavian aircraft was taking off. What was not so clear was why exactly this happened. Investigators determined that perhaps due to a lack of situational awareness in the low visibility, the pilots of the Cessna turned right at the point where the yellow taxi line split in two directions on the west apron, instead of left. This meant that it would taxi to the south along Romeo 6, rather than north above the runway at Romeo 5. There was far more to this mistake than pilot error, however. Investigators found that signs along the taxiways were badly worn down, and in some cases were obscured by overgrown grass. These did not conform to regulation standards, yet nothing had been done about this by the airport authorities. What's more, when the pilots of the Cessna correctly reported their position at Sierra 4, the controller disregarded that information, because that taxiway label was not on his maps, and he wasn't aware of its existence. Rather than telling the aircraft to stop immediately because he had no idea where it was, he was happy to allow it to continue its taxi around the airport while aircraft were taking off nearby in near zero visibility conditions. In a final tragic twist, Lenate had one last line of defense against runway incursions of this kind. This system used motion sensors to detect when an aircraft had entered the runway and alerted controllers when this occurred. However, the system was prone to false alarms being generated by animals and vehicles, and so it had been turned off at Lenate. If we rewind this story back to the beginning, however, we end up not on Lenate's east apron with a wrong turn. Rather, we end up on final approach to runway 36. Why? Because the pilots of the Citation jet had landed at Lenate just a few minutes beforehand, in conditions which they were not certified to land in. Their licenses limited them to landing in visibility of no less than 550 metres, yet the visibility at Lenate was well below this. They should have diverted to another airport, yet they landed illegally at Lenate. If they had boarded their approach and flown to a nearby alternate airport, this accident would never have occurred. Or, it might be more accurate to say that this accident would still have occurred, just not on this particular day. As I'm sure you've gathered, all of these mistakes and lapses in safety were not merely unfortunate coincidences. There was a sloppiness and a carelessness at Lenate Airport, both on the part of the controllers and on the part of those in charge of ensuring that the airport complied with regulations to do with airport mapping and taxiway signage. An accident like this was bound to happen at some point. In fact, this accident was so overdue that an almost identical one nearly happened at Lenate just a day before the crash. The previous afternoon, on October 7, 2001, a private jet misunderstood the ground controller's taxi instructions and taxied on Romeo 6 rather than Romeo 5 on its way from the west apron to the runway. This is exactly the same mistake that the Cessna citation crew made the following day. On this day, the visibility was more than 2,000 metres, but the controller still didn't spot the aircraft using the wrong taxiway, nor did he notice that the pilot didn't correctly read back his taxi instructions. It was only at the last moment, when the pilot of the private jet noticed another aircraft coming towards him on the taxiway, that he alerted the controller to the situation and disaster was averted. Less than one month before that incident, on September 18th, 2001, another runway incursion took place. A British Midland pilot reported hearing the following conversation between an aircraft and a controller over the radio. Where are you going? You've entered the runway. Oh, sorry. It's okay, there's no traffic at the moment. A collision at Milan Zanate Airport was waiting to happen for years, and on October 8, 2001, the inevitable happened, taking the lives of 114 passengers and crew on two aircraft and four personnel on the ground. As a result of the crash, air traffic controller Paolo Zacchetti and former head of the air traffic control agency Sandro Gulano were sentenced to eight years in prison and six and a half years in prison respectively. In 2006, these sentences were reduced by three years. It took the loss of all of these lives to wake up the Italian authorities to the danger lurking at Lenate Airport. After the incident, they quickly installed the ground radar system, which had been lying in a box at the airport for years. They also updated the taxiway signage and introduced more stringent procedures for controllers and pilots to follow while on the ground. Since this disaster, there has not been another collision at Lenate. Big thanks to everybody who signed up to support the channel on Patreon and YouTube. Your contributions are really appreciated and they're helping turn Green Dot into a viable project. This year, my goal is to continue improving the production quality of these videos, and I'm hoping that the audience for Green Dot continues to grow along with this. If you'd like to support the channel, you can sign up on Patreon in the link in the description, or tap the join button here on YouTube. Thanks again for watching.